Welcome to a new chapter. In this chapter, we will be looking at our kins and the dishy reactions they undergo. We will be breaking the reactions into three videos. In this video, we will first start by broadly introducing alkenes and discussing the addition reactions. We will then dive into our first reaction, which is the hydrohalogenation. Finally, we will end our video with acid catalyzed hydration. Addition reactions are very important in material science. As you see here, synthetic material made from polystyrene, like this PVC or styrofoam cutleries, are made from addition reactions of molecules derived from petroleum. So this group of reactions is characterized by the addition of the X and the Y group across the double bond. And in this process, a pi bond is broken, converted into two new sigma bonds, one connected to the X, the other connected to the Y. So in this video and in the subsequent videos covering this chapter, we will look at many addition reactions and we will classify them by what is the X and the Y that is being added. We will look at hydrohalogenation reactions where we're adding an H plus X. And in this case, an X is a halogen, either that be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. We can also add an HOH across that double bond. And HOH is essentially water, right? So that type of reaction is called hydration. We can simply add two hydrogens across that double bond, and if you do so, that's called hydrogenation. Instead of adding any hydrogens, we want both of those groups to be halogens, then we have done halogenation. And in particular, we're adding two chlorines or two bromines across that double bond. Similar to that, instead of adding two halogens, we add only one halogen, either chlorine, bromine, or iodine, and then an OH on the other side. That would be called halohydrin formation. And then lastly, if you want to instead add two OHs across that double bond, we will call that dihydroxylation. And so you can see that alkene is very reactive to many different molecules, as you can see from the many different addition reactions that are observed. And so what makes that alkene so reactive? And remember how we discussed pi bonds are centers of high electron density? Because it is a source of electron, that pi bond can serve as either a nucleophile or even a base. If that pi bond is attacking a proton, we call that it behaving as a base. When that pi bond attacks an electrophile, we call that a nucleophile. And in fact, all of those addition reactions either is the result of the alkene acting as the base or as the alkene acting as a nucleophile. Again, re-emphasizing the motif in organic chemistry that you have positive attracted to negative, right? A region of high electron density is attracted to a region of low electron density. So a nucleophilic center will have a high reactivity with an electrophilic center. So before we go into the chemistry of it all, let's take a step back and take a look at where you can find alkenes in nature. And this functional group is found in various molecules, ranging from a molecule found in roses that is responsible for its fragrance, to all the way to it being a part of the sex pheromone of the common housefly, to being found in cholesterol. Notice the difference between the cholesterol and the other two molecules is that this alkene is part of a ring. So alkenes can also be found in rings, just like in this molecule, limonene, the smell of oranges, um, the alkene is within that six-membered ring. And as alluded to in the introduction, alkenes has a heavy presence in industry. The two heavily used molecules, ethylene and propylene, both derived from petroleum, can be used to make a plethora of molecules, like some molecules you may are familiar with, like acetic acid, acetone, isopropyl alcohol or to the plastics that we talked about earlier, the polyethylene. All right, now let's take a further look at the reaction itself. And as we have referenced in the beginning of this uh, video, the addition reaction we learned in this chapter is basically the reverse reaction of the elimination reaction we learned in the alkyl halide chapter. And in fact, these two reactions are at equilibrium. So then which side is favored is actually dependent on temperature. It turns out addition reactions is favored at low temperatures, whereas the elimination reaction is favored at elevated temperatures. 
In order to understand that, let's review a little bit of thermodynamics that you may have learned in the previous year in general chemistry. Remember the delta G term? And remember how the delta G factor determines whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. When the delta G value is negative, right? If it's negative, then your reaction will be spontaneous. And so delta G is dependent on two terms. One is called the enthalpy term, often called heat, and the other term is called the entropy term, uh, often related to order or disorder in a reaction. So whether uh, a full reaction is favored or the reverse reaction is favored will depend on these two terms. So let's break down these two terms for our elimination and addition case. Let's take an example of this simple reaction where you have this ethene reacting with HCl, so adding H and Cl across that double bond. So first, as you can see here, we're breaking that pi bond and breaking that HCl bond in order uh, to form two new sigma bonds, the H to the carbon bond and the Cl to the carbon bond. So let's calculate the enthalpy of this reaction, the heat of this reaction. So these values are pulled from a reference table, but the essence of it all is that on the left-hand side, the reactant side, both of those two bonds that are being broken is worth 166 kilocalories per mole, while on the product side, both of those bonds that are formed are worth 185 kilocalories per mole. And so the enthalpy term is calculated from bonds broken minus the bonds formed. And bonds broken here, again, is highlighted in red. Bonds formed is highlighted in that blue color. So we put those two numbers in together. We will find that the enthalpy term is negative 19 kcal per mole. So the key factor here is that it is indeed negative. So let's go back to this equation here. If the delta H term is negative, and again, if we want delta G to be spontaneous, in the forward reaction, then you want it to be negative. Right? So the forward reaction again is the addition reaction. Okay, so again, let's go back here. We have calculated that in general, the delta H term will be a negative term. So that's already favoring our delta G to be negative, right? So now let's go to the next term, the entropy term. Notice that if you go from the reactant side to the product side, you are going from two molecules to one molecule. Which one has more order? The one molecule, right? Two things versus one. One has more order than two things. Two possibilities is more chaotic, you can say, than having one possibility. So going in the forward reaction from reactant to product, you see there's a decrease in disorder. Remember, the term disorder can be a proxy for entropy. So we can say if disorder is decreasing, then the delta S term, entropy, is also decreasing. If that term is decreasing, that's a negative sign, right? Note that entropy is multiplied by a negative T. That negative sign multiplied by the negative entropy makes this term a positive term. Remember again that this was a negative term, but then this is counterbalancing it out. This positive is counteracting this negative. So really, it really depends on temperature, right? Because this temperature can magnify this term. Let's say if this temperature is very small, the entropy term is insignificant. Therefore, enthalpy will determine whether this reaction is going forward or not. And since enthalpy is negative, then the forward reaction is favored. Now, if temperature is very high, then it will magnify this positive term. If it magnifies this positive term so much, it will dwarf this enthalpy term. Then delta G will be positive. Then the forward reaction is not favored. Or in other words, the reverse reaction, the elimination, is favored. So you can see here, at lower temperature, it favors the forward reaction, the addition reaction, and at higher temperatures, it favors the reverse reaction, in this case, the elimination reaction. All right, now that we are more familiar with alkenes and the addition reactions there to go, let's now start discussing actual reactions. So our first one we will take a look at is hydrohalogenation, adding a hydrogen and a halogen 
across that double bond. So for example, if we have this alkene, we add HBr into the mix, you will form this alkyl bromide product. Notice that this alkene is symmetrical, so that Br can go on the left or on the right-hand side, and it will be the same molecule. However, there are circumstances where you will have an alkene that is not symmetrical. In that case, where does the halogen go? So let me introduce some terminologies for you here. The carbon that is a part of that pi bond, we call that the vanillic carbon. So those are the vanillic positions. So the question again to be rephrased is, in which of those vanillic positions will the halogen be added? And as you may have noticed, the difference here is that one vanillic position has more hydrogens connected to it than the other. Or another way of saying it is one vanillic position has more carbon bonds connected to it. That problem again is a problem of regiochemistry. Where will new bonds be formed? All right, let's zoom into this case here, and particularly like, taking a look at the two vanillic positions. As stated, this vanillic position has one hydrogen attached to it. So if it has a hydrogen attached to it, we can say it has less substitution, less carbons attached to it. Whereas the second vanillic position has no hydrogens, or in other words, more carbon bonds. So there is indeed a preference. The halogen will be added at the vanillic position with less hydrogens. Or in other words, the hydrogen will be added at a position with more hydrogens. Both of those statements are true. Either way, you want to take a look at it. One easy way to remember this, as I was told by one other professor, is that hydrogens will be added to the side with more hydrogens. So how would you remember that? And so this professor said the idea of the rich getting richer, the poor getting poor. So if this position here already has a hydrogen, it will be enriched more with hydrogens. So that's one mnemonic device you can use to remember this rule. And in fact, this rule is known as the Markovnikov. It is regional selective for Markovnikov, which was named after the scientists who studied this reaction in the mid-1800s. To state that again, in the Malkonikov addition is when the halogen is installed at the more substituted carbon and the hydrogen is placed at the vanillic carbon that has more hydrogens. Now as a part of how science works, once Malkonikov established this rule, many other scientists will try to see if it does work. However, some of them, whenever they do this reaction, found that the Makovnikov rule does not work, that the reverse reference will be the observed product, where the bromine atom is installed at the less substituted carbon. And there were very bizarre reasons as to why this was. Some even suggested, for example, that it was dependent on the face of the moon, and the Makovnikov product will be formed versus the opposite. But it turns out, it really depends on the purity of your reagent. And more specifically, if you use an impure reagent, you will get the anti markovnikov product. And so as good science goes, even if there is a mistake, you will try to investigate what that mistake was because it will give you a new finding. In this case, it was found that the impurity that causes the anti markovnikov product to be formed are peroxides. Even with trace amounts of these peroxides, you will get what, what is now known as the anti markovnikov addition. Peroxides, remember, is basically a molecule with a weak oxygen-oxygen bond. Those oxygens can be connected to other uh, alkyl groups. As long as you have that weak oxygen-oxygen bond, it is considered a peroxide. But so we generally write that as R-O-O-R. -O -O so in this chapter, the important part is to know uh, if you add HBr2 and alkene, you will get a Markovnikov reaction. But if you add in peroxides to it, you will get the anti markovnikov addition. We won't go into the detail of this second reaction. It, it, it involves radical chemistry, which is a different chapter, but just know this reaction as part of the tools in your tool set. All right, let's now go to the whiteboard to draw out this mechanism. So again, we have the alkene is our nucleophile. So you have to draw the arrow starting from the alkene towards our proton here, so in an acid-base reaction, grabbing that proton and therefore breaking the hydrogen bromine bond. So draw the arrow from that bond ending at the bromine atom, giving us the intermediate. So that hydrogen will be added to the side with more hydrogens. So it's going to be added to the right-hand side. Remember, because 
there is a hidden hydrogen that we don't always draw out. So that's the Makovnikov preferred position. So remember that this pi bond was broken here so that it only has three bonds left. Because of that, this is a carbocation. So it has a positive charge one there. Now we have this bromide ion that is full of electrons and ready to attack an electrophile, drawing from that lone pair, attacking at that carbocation center. This then will give us our new bromine molecule. So you can draw like that, but remember that hydrogens don't have to be drawn in necessarily, so you can also just simply leave out the hydrogens and draw the product like so. All right, so with that mechanism, let's take a look at the energy diagram for the reaction. Remember, it was a two-step process, so you will have two humps in this pathway. The first step is the proton transfer step, and the result of that is a carbocation intermediate. Remember, carbocations are highly unstable. Because of this, this is quite an elevated intermediate. The second step is a nucleophilic attack, which brings us down to a more stable product. And so it turns out the first step is your rate limiting step. It has the highest activation energy. So let's keep this in mind to explore why then would the Makovnikov product be favored. You can hypothesize that that pathway can form the anti-Makovnikov too, where the addition of that pi bond takes the hydrogen into the more substituted carbon, leaving us this secondary carbocation intermediate. Whereas in the quote-unquote Makovnikov pathway, that pi bond takes that proton to the less substituted carbon, leaving behind a carbocation that's tertiary. Right? So compare these two possible intermediates. Which one will be more stable, do you think? Right? So tertiary is more stable than secondary due to hyperconjugation. So in the second pathway, if the intermediate is more stable, then its transition state is also lower due to Hammond's postulates. And so because the tertiary carbocation intermediate has a lower energy pathway, it is the preferred pathway, which explains why the Makovnikov product is favored. So again, in summary, the Makovnikov product is favored because it goes through a more stable carbocation intermediate, lowering the activation energy of its rate determining step, that first step of forming the carbocation, and therefore making it faster and the more preferred pathway. Now that we got the regiochemistry out of the way, now let's take a look at stereochemistry. And let's take a look at this example here, when you have this alkene that is not symmetrical, um, and you add HCl across that double bond. Okay, so again, regiochemistry tells us that the Cl will be added at the more substituted vanillic position as seen there. But notice once the chlorine is added to that position, that becomes a chiral center. If that chlorine is coming out at us wedged, then it would be an R enantiomer, whereas, whereas if the chlorine is going away, it is the opposite, so it is the S enantiomer. And it turns out both of these enantiomers are formed in equal amounts. So why is that? So recall back that this reaction goes through a carbocation intermediate. And recall the geometry of a carbocation. It is sp2 hybridized and has an empty p orbital. If it's sp2 hybridized carbon, then you have a trigonal planar geometry where the R groups are all flat. R being hydrogens or carbons, right? If it's flat out, laid out like this, and the p orbital is orthogonal, so 90 degrees, away from that plane, then the p orbital has a lobe above and below that plane. Remember the empty p orbital is where it is lacking in electrons. So that's where the nucleophile will attack. So if you have a nucleophile that attacks from the above, you will form this molecule. Whereas the same nucleophile, if it attacks from the bottom, you will form this molecule. And it turns out these two molecules are mirror images of each other, but they're not superimposable. So therefore, we have formed what is known as enantiomers. Notice that the top or the bottom orbital has equal access. So that's why the molecules will form both molecules in equal amounts. Uh, in that case, we get what is known as a racemic mixture. So let's go back to this uh, example here. Does this product have enantiomers? Notice that 
since the bromine is added to that carbon and that carbon is not a chiral center, you will not be creating a racemic mixture since so two enantiomers aren't created, just one molecule will be created. So let's do a, one example here. Draw the mechanism and predict the major product of this reaction. So if I'm going to draw the mechanism, I'm going to clearly draw out the HBr bond since that's the bond that's going to be broken. The pi bond attacks the proton, grabbing it and therefore breaking the hydrogen bromine bond. All right, so remember the hydrogen will be added to this position, so giving us our carbon cation there, followed by the addition of this bromine via nucleophilic attack towards the carbon cation. Okay, so we have this as our final product. And again, because chiral centers aren't created, there's only one product. So that's one issue caused by the carbocation. A second thing that is caused by the carbocation, as you may remember, is that it is possible to rearrange. Because the carbocation is unstable, it will try to rearrange into another carbocation that is more stable. So for example, if you did this reaction, you might predict the Markovnikov product will give you the chlorine attached to the more substituted vanillic carbon like so. Where it turns out, this is also another product. This is what we call the rearrangement product. And it turns out it is the major product, 60% versus 40% in this case. So let's go to the drawing board here to see this mechanism at work. Um, you have a pi bond, so it's going to do a base attack on that proton, breaking that HCl bond. Okay, so that hydrogen will be added here giving you a carbocation. So normally, we have the chloride, the nucleophile, come in and do an attack, and giving us our expected um, Makovnikov product. However, just as how the mantra goes, if a carbocation rearrangement can occur to give you a more stable carbocation, it likely will happen. So in this case, it does readily do so. So we don't actually get this product. What we get is the first rearrangement. So take a look at this carbocation. How can it be more stable? It is now secondary. So what's better than secondary is tertiary. So how can we make it tertiary? Notice that this right here is tertiary. So we probably will do a hydride shift, right? So remember there's a hydrogen there. So if we draw it doing a hydride shift. So remember that there was already a hydrogen back there, so it's just simply a neutral carbon now. I'm not drawing in this hydrogen anymore because again there was two other hydrogens there and I'm just going to simply leave it without the hydrogens. Okay, But in essence now you have a tertiary carbocation, so at this point the chloride will then do an attack to the carbocation and adding the chlorine at that new position. Okay, so this is the rearranged Markovnikov product. So this is a key drawback of this reaction, is having this uh, rearrangement product. So when you do a synthesis problem, uh, be aware of this uh, possible rearrangement that can happen. So that wraps up our first reaction, and in that reaction we learned how to pay attention to regional chemistry and stereochemistry, which is going to be a theme of most of the reactions going forward in this chapter. So now let's move on to our second reaction here, and we will end with this reaction for today. The overall theme of this addition reaction is adding a hydrogen and an OH across the double bond. And HOH, again, um, is water, right? So this reaction is also known as hydration. And there are actually many ways of doing this. The first way is what is known as acid catalyzed hydration. From the name of this reaction, you know that acid is required. So oftentimes, H2O plus is written as your acid. So when you see H3O plus written like that, it is actually shorthand for the reaction with water with a small amount of acid source, oftentimes is sulfuric acid. You could also re see it written with water and H2SO4 in brackets like that. It is in catalytic amount or in small amounts. So the rate of the acid catalyzed hydration is very much dependent on the structure of the starting alkene. So now let's compare the relative rates of the following reactions to see the effect of how having substituents on the vanillic position affects the relative rate of each reaction. The first one we have here 
So we call that relative rate of one has basically no substituents. Once you add on one substituent, you notice that the rate has increased by a million fold, 10 to the sixth power. If you add a second substituent group, that increases even further by a factor of 10 to the 11th fold. Okay, so what does this data tell us? It seems that the more substitution you have, the faster your reaction is. And remember what faster reaction is, right? That means its intermediate is more stabilized, activation energy is lower, which supports the mechanism that we have seen in the previous reaction of the halogenation. Again, so let's go ahead and draw that mechanism here. First step is pi bond attacking in a base fashion, extracting that proton, breaking that OH bond. The hydrogen adds to the less substituted side, giving us our carbocation there. If you want to be explicit, you can draw in all your hydrogens, but that one's... And then so at this stage, you have your water molecule doing a attack, nucleophilic attack. This time I'm going to omit the hydrogens for clarity. Remember that water attacking has two hydrogens still attached to it, so you form this oxonium ion. So the last step then is a proton transfer where another water molecule takes away that proton reforming H3O+, which is why it's called acid catalyze. So the fact that H3O+, is regenerated means it is a catalyst. It is not consumed in the reaction itself. So again, this is called the oxonium ion intermediate. It's basically when you have like a, an alcohol-like molecule where the positive charge is on the oxygen. So notice in, in this reaction, it's also selective for Makovnikov where the hydrogen is added to the side with more hydrogens. And it's for the same reason as we saw before, because then it will transition through a more stable carbocation intermediate, the more substituted carbocation intermediate, um, therefore making the reaction faster, as we just have seen in the data previously. The more substitution that vanillic position is, the faster this reaction is. In any case, at the end of that, you get your final hydration product, which, by the way, what functional group is that? Yep, so this is a way to form an alcohol. So this brings us back to the reaction we've seen in the previous chapter where you have an alcohol and you make an alkene. And in this chapter, we learned the opposite, where you have an alkene and then you make an alcohol from that. So besides controlling this reaction with temperature, you can also control it with Le Chatelier's principle. Remember that principle learned last year in general chemistry? Uh, well, if you don't, Le Chatelier's principle states that a system in equilibrium will adjust, will change in a way in order to minimize any stress placed upon it. So if we take a look at this equilibrium here, water is actually on the left-hand side. It is on the reactant side. So how do we favor a reaction going in the forward direction? So if we add more water, more reactant, which is the stress, Le Chatelier says, if you add that stress, it will try to undo that stress. So if you add more reactant, it will have those reactants react and shifting, making more products. So adding more water will favor the forward reaction. So what does what more water mean? More water just means a more diluted sulfuric acid solution, right? Because if you add more water, it will dilute out this reaction. Now, if you want the reaction to go in the reverse, where you want the alcohol to make the alkene, you want less water, right? You want to remove the water reactant. Again, Le Chatelier says if you remove that reactant, it will make more reactants to counterbalance that action. So less water. What does less water mean? Less water, which just means more concentrated H2SO4 solution. So this is a cool way to exploit Le Chatelier's principle to control the equilibrium, to control if we want the alkene or if we want the alcohol. All right, so we've seen how we can control the equilibrium, whether controlling temperature or the concentration of reagents. All right, so now let's take a look at the stereochemistry of the hydration reaction. Because it undergoes a carbocation uh, mechanism, the hydration stereochemistry is very similar to that of the halogenation reaction. Um, you will get a 50-50 mixture of the Makovnikov product for the same reason, right? You have that MTP orbital that is part of that trigonal planar geometry, so it has an orbital on the top or an orbital on the bottom. If the water molecule attacks from the top, you get a different enantiomer than a water molecule attacking from the bottom 
of that carbocation. So again, if enantiomers are indeed formed, then you will have a racemic mixture. But remember to check that indeed those two molecules are enantiomers from each other. So, all right, so we'll stop uh, with part one of the alkenes chapter here. Um, we will have two more parts in this three-part series.